Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> you made it. Thank you. First of all, a sincere apology. What a gorgeous day, and here we are inside. Um, but hopefully the sunshine of the knowledge that you will gain today will compensate for the sunshine you miss. Okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> my name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of Cali, and here we are in the second day of the Conference for Law School Computing. A couple of uh, housekeeping things. Oh, 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 oh. Um, the breakfast and lunch tomorrow, Saturday, will not be at the tent or downstairs in the first floor. They'll be in the second floor in Milstein East. Are we in Milstein East? Yeah, right down the hall. Right down the hall, okay. Uh, don't forget, you can bring your luggage tomorrow if you got a flight right after. Room 3016 um, has to be removed by 2 p.m. There will be library tours again at 12 and 12.30 and that's right outside the tent in front of uh, E. Langdell Hall. <laughs> I can't help that. I can't help that. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a tech tour uh, and the, at noon, meet in the lobby of uh, Wasserstein. So downstairs in the lobby. Uh, some of you have complained to me about the difficulty of the social game. Suck it up. <laughs> By the way, anybody, anybody at 16? Anybody? All right, I'm going to cross that off now. So, what, what, what's your name? Christine Hepler. Hi, Christine. Good. Anybody at 32? <laughs> Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, six, six, no, okay, never mind. <laughs> Remember, there's a GoPro. There's a GoPro if you complete it. Okay, if you don't complete it, I'm not gonna complain that much, but you put your name and address, uh, email address and um, add your institutional affiliation in case we can't read your handwriting. There's a box at registration where you can put it in. It's a, it's a separate raffle. You do not have to be present to win. Uh, somebody asked me about, somebody asked me about the sharks because we're doing this whole new wave thing, but there's nothing about sharks. Well, we struggled with how, where to go with the theme. We intentionally choose themes that are somewhat ambiguous and double entendre-like so that we can let the speakers choose uh, titles and things that, um, you know, let them go off in multiple directions. But, but my, my thinking at the time for sharks was that, you know, you know how sharks are traditionally uh, associated with lawyers, right? Uh, ambulance chasers or the shark circle or stuff like that. Well, I think we should take back the shark as people in the legal profession. And, and I'll give you at least three good reasons. One is, uh, you know, sharks have been around for 300 million years. They're survivors, right? And we need to be survivors. Number two, sharks um, although I, I think I, when I looked this up on Wikipedia, it's a myth. But it's a myth that I believe, so I will tell you it. Um, you know, they have to keep moving, otherwise they'll die, right? They have to keep moving to let the uh, water go over their lung, uh, their gills. And that is certainly true for us. We cannot stand still in the uh, movement of, uh, of change and technology and the crises we're dealing with. So we, are, we have to be like a shark in that regard. And the last thing is sharks will eat anything. And we have to stop thinking about ourselves as having a single diet of ideas or a single, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good enough one, a, a single diet of ideas <laughs> and be willing to take on new tasks and different, uh, different projects. So um, I'm saying take back the shark. We can be sharks. They're good things, right? All right, yeah. Last thing, um, nope, wasn't gonna do that. Wait, somebody just texted me, probably have something. Oh yeah, don't forget to turn off your cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our, our keynote speaker, Dorothea Salo, is a faculty associated at the University of Wisconsin School of Library and Information Studies. 
So when we were looking at keynote speakers, um, more than one person, more than two persons, actually several people said, you should check out Dorothea. And so I did, and I got uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know. And then I realized, ooh, wait, that's a good feeling when you're looking for keynotes. People that make you a little uncomfortable. People that, you're, that, will, that will not just confirm what you already believe, but that will challenge your beliefs or your ideas. People that will um, open new vistas you know, in your mind. And that's what I uh, hope to hear from Dorothea. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for being here. My name is Dorothea Salo. And we heard yesterday from Jason about how scary an angry archivist can be. My job is actually making angry archivists. It's what I do. Now, really, the reason I'm here, uh, besides that I make people very, very uncomfortable, I saw you looking at the purple hair yesterday. Um, I teach technology, among other things, in a professional school. It's library school, not law school, but I think we're gonna find we have a lot in common. And one thing I know that our professions have in common is a lot of swirling anxiety about technology and technology education. And sometimes that fuels great things like this very conference, but speaking as an educator, I find it also fuels a lot of miscommunication and really weird expectations, and that kind of frustrates me. Maybe you too? I think part of the problem is some cultural myths about technology and people who work with technology that we're all kind of struggling with. So I want to talk about those myths and the damage that I think they do. And I want to push back on them. And I want to suggest some ways that all of us, educators, technologists, professionals, students, can start to move past them. And I want to start with the myth of the purple squirrel. So what in the world is a purple squirrel, you may well ask. Some of you may have actually heard the phrase purple unicorn. Is that a little more familiar to some of you? But purple squirrel is actually a thing. It's mostly recruiters and HR people who use it. It's got a Wikipedia entry. See, that's how you know it's real. If you look on Amazon, if you look on Amazon, there's an entire book about purple squirrel, so I ran with it. A purple squirrel, for purposes of this talk, is the perfect technology hire you see in really bad job ads. The one person who can do everything imaginable with technology, so nobody else ever has to touch a keyboard. The brilliant polymath who knows everything about every technology since forever and never, ever, ever makes a technology mistake. So in other words, hiring a purple squirrel into a library or a law firm lets technology be somebody else's problem, as Douglas Adams would have put it. Let me just say this is probably not news to anybody, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is not a real healthy way to think about technology. It's not good in libraries, not good in law firms. So if by some freak of chance you actually haven't seen the purple squirrel in job ads, I certainly have, I do know one place you have seen him. And that's in technology competency lists. <laughs> which the library school I work, work in is right in the middle of an accreditation cycle right now, so let me say this with feeling. There are a lot of competency lists out there. A lot of them have technology, and holy wow, so many. Now, my sincere apologies here to Wilhelmina Ranke and the other people who were in the competency list compiling session yesterday, because I know the intention behind these is noble, is holy, I get that. But are you kidding me with these things? Are you kidding me? You could spend a lifetime learning technology and still not be competent. According to these lists, the only conceivable competent person is a purple squirrel. Competency lists, as they currently exist, are just total purple squirrels. Felt. I cannot even. Moving on. How do you detect a purple squirrel job ad or a competency list? in the wild. There are some classic warning signs. The first thing is to look for a demand for more years of experience in something that are actually possible. So in honor <laughs> of yesterday's keynote or the amazing Jason Scott, I'll use this hypothetical example. Three years of experience working with JSON-LD. For our purposes, it doesn't even matter what JSON-LD actually is. 
But I know a lot of you were in one or another of the semantic web link data sessions yesterday. So, um, so you heard a little bit about the semantic web and link data. So JSON-LD, all it is, is a slightly web-friendly or web developer-friendlier way of writing linked data. That doesn't matter. We don't actually care. What we care about today is that this requirement actually looks fine, completely unexceptionable, until you find out that the standard didn't come out until January of this year. Um, I would not actually be surprised to find that this job ad already exists. I made it up out of my head, so if you wrote it, don't sue me. Um, I didn't look. Another classic sign of purple squirrelishness is asking for every tech skill and every tech book and every tech library everywhere in the same ad. So you want somebody who knows SQL and databases, right? You know, basic technology. And web design, so HTML and CSS. And they've got to program in at least six different programming languages, right? And they have to be a systems and network administrator, and they need to be able to do tech support for everybody else in the office, and they need to be a gadget hound who can develop those mobile apps that are so important these days, and they've got to be a total social media whiz because you've got to keep those likes coming, and, and, and a floor wax and a dessert topping. Are you kidding me here? What in the world, people? But I keep seeing these job ads and these competency lists, and nobody calls them out on how totally absurd they are because we have this notion, this purple squirrel myth, that tech people are automatically omni-capable. And if this is your notion, you don't really understand how all of the things I threw up on this screen are kind of different from one another, you've probably written a job ad for a purple squirrel, and heaven help you, you probably pitched it at entry level. I know you did. <laughs> and if you've done that, I'd love it if you stopped. Please, I'm begging you here, please stop. Because true confession, pulp bestseller time here, I was a purple squirrel once. So, you know, that's the reason for the ensemble here. Um, wouldn't want you to think I'm an eccentric or something. There was actually a reason for this. And yeah, I know the Latin on the back cover isn't quite right, but you know, pulp publishing, right? What are you gonna do? Very similitude. When I got out of library school, I knew just enough about a fair variety of different technology things to be dangerous. So I got hired into academic libraries to do all the technology stuff and all the other stuff relating to scholarly communication. You know, talk about your, your, your purple squirrelishness. And being a purple squirrel kind of made me want to write this book. I didn't. I actually hired the brilliant Tommy Jonk to fake up this book cover for me. But I kind of wish this book existed <laughs> now that the cover does. So at this point, you may be saying, OK, fine. I admit, this purple squirrel myth, it's a thing. It doesn't mean, so what? Does it matter? How much damage can a myth really do? Well, one thing is that there are people who tell outright lies about being purple squirrels, and they still get hired because nobody doing the hire knows enough to call them on it. I'm sure there are as many horror stories out there as I can tell. And then there are people like me who can fake being a purple squirrel well enough. And you know, we're not mean-spirited. We do our best, but the expectations on us are kind of ridiculous. I know what happens to those people. I was one. You probably know two. And spoiler, it's not anything good. We become targets. Any workplace that's tech impoverished enough to want to hire a purple squirrel is not really into tech in the first place, right? And you know, that, that's an understatement. A lot of people in a purple squirrel workplace hate technology, fear it, I guarantee. And in my experience, and more recently, the experience of some of my students, they have no scruples about displacing that hate and that fear onto a purple squirrel hire. Not to mention using organizational and budgetary power, soft power, if you will, to make sure that the purple squirrel can't get anything done. 
And can I say, as somebody who teaches technology, this really bothers me. Really bothers me. I do not want my best, most tech-savvy people graduating to become targets. How is it even ethical to ask me to train people up for target practice? Not cool. So I really want our professions, law and librarianship, to do better by our tech-savvy people. Partly because the whole displacing work onto other people and the dismissive treatment thing has got some really skeevy, gross historical echoes in law and in librarianship. Are you wincing yet? Let me make it worse. I will make it worse. How about now? Both our professions have a history of shoving off work that we do not want to do on other people, sometimes in creepy, gross, gendered, racialized, class-bound, ageist ways. That's not OK. This is damage that I think the purple squirrel myth actually perpetuates, because whoever purple squirrels are, they're not us. They're not us professionals, whoever we are. Um, Here's one that actually happened to me. This is something that I overheard shortly after starting my very first job as a professional librarian. And just goes to show, right, whatever technology is in law or in librarianship, it's not real law. It's not real librarianship. It's just, what? what? What is this divide? And why do some of us seem to think it's OK? that the tech happens over here and we resolutely remain ignorant as though technology somehow is not part of the regular praxis of both our professions. Why? Why this is OK? Because not news, I'm sure, but tech ignorance really hurts. For one thing, tech ignorance is how law firms, libraries, governments embarrass themselves and hurt other people. A million examples, right? Here's just a few. And these are all from the last, like, year. Law professor didn't encrypt his laptop or his hard drive storage, had a bunch of really sensitive data stolen from it. Ouch. And if that law professor happens to be in this room, I'm really sorry. I didn't use your name on purpose. Um, this, but still, it's got to be painful. If you'd like a consultation about how not to have this happen again, research data management, it's kind of a thing I teach and can consult with people on. Totally here for you. Um, the nation's security establishment, totally owned by a web crawler, right? Everybody's laughing at the Federal Register, which apparently can only accept digital documents on three and a half inch floppies in 2013. What? This one's great. Maybe you heard it already. Um, gigantic multi-million dollar court case lost because the plaintiff's lawyers did not realize that their client was faking emails that they entered into evidence. Nice. Gotta love it. If that's not enough, you can get yelled at from the federal bench these days for screwing up the tech. Um, and here's the thing here. It's not the purple squirrel of the law firm that's getting yelled at. It's the lawyer. And you know, I didn't even have to resort to talking about redaction. If I was going to talk, you could talk about redaction failures all day. So that's damage that tech ignorance does. I also want to suggest that bad tech hiring is also serious damage caused by this myth. And of course, it's damage that goes on to cause even more damage. Purple squirrel job ads, I strongly believe that they mean that law firms, libraries, governments do not get the tech hires that they need. Because look, I only took the purple squirrel job because I was young and stupid. Okay, Tech savvy people who've been around the block a few times, they can spot a purple squirrel job ad from miles away and they do not apply. Because nobody wants to be the workplace target for technology hate and discontent. Come on. It's not fun. It's all right. People who want purple squirrels cannot hire them. 
So if you're having trouble hiring a purple squirrel, what do you do? Every single educator in this room knows the answer to this, right? <laughs> it's got to be a professional education problem, right? This is totally my life now, teaching technology. In a library school, I'm getting blamed for everything. Everything you can possibly imagine, no matter what. I mean, the lights won't, must be a technology education problem. Um, ask any practicing librarian or archivist. I'll tell you, I'm doing everything wrong, and I totally suck. Because all educators suck, and I'm an educator, right? Simple, Aristotelian syllogism here. I'm, bet I'm, not, I'm betting I'm not the only tech educator in the room who's feeling this right now. Everybody wants you to graduate the purple squirrel lawyer. Everybody wants me to graduate the purple squirrel brarian. And everybody yells at us constantly like we're not smart enough to figure out that's what you want. Um, I know that's what everybody wants. I swear, I know. You don't have to yell at me anymore about it. I know. But I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's not that I don't want to, Dave. It's not that I wouldn't if I could, Dave. It's that given the time and resources I have, Dave, the students I'm working with, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. I will make bold to say that if you were standing in my purple pumps, you couldn't do that either, Dave. <laughs> now, I'm indebted to UK law librarian Pete Smith for how I'm about to explain why I can't do that. Most students entering library school are the technology equivalent of couch potatoes. They don't have a whole lot of experience with technology beyond the really basic consumer level. Not used to it. They have not been taught about it. And I've asked around, right? Is it just our students? Are we admitting the wrong people? What's going on here? And the answer I always get is no, 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 no. We're all dealing with this. It's not just you. Every library school is dealing with this. I'll go out on a limb here, say it's probably true of law school as well. I mean, I, can I hear some affirmation? <laughs> um, law school students, like library school students, mostly start out as technology couch potatoes. And we educators have two or three years, assuming a full-time student, to do something about that. And not two or three whole years either. No, 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 no. They got two or three years where they're doing a whole lot of other things. And we tech instructors see them for maybe one to three courses. And that's it. That's what we got. So in those two to three years, one to three courses, I've found that students can do the rough technology equivalent of a couch to 5K run. <laughs> Turns out that in physical exercise terms, couch to 5K is a thing that a fair few people can realistically do. Not everybody, but a lot. Is anybody here on Couch to 5K? Yeah, right? Um, I'm actually a cyclist because my ankles won't do running. But there are great materials out there that show people step by step how to get from being a couch potato to being able to do a 5K run without injuring themselves, without giving up. And there's lots of help and encouragement and equipment recommendations and all that really good stuff. And I flatter myself. And maybe I'm just flattering myself, but I flatter myself that I do pretty well at couch to 5K technology training. Not alone in this, a lot of other people do too. So in library professional education, couch to 5K is happening. I'm certainly not planning to stop. And the sense I get is that law is working in that direction. Problem is that the library world, and I'm guessing the law world too, is not happy with couch to 5K. What they actually want is couch to amazing long distance Olympic gold medalist Mo Farah. <laughs> okay, so couch to Mo Farah, you got three years max. Go to it, you lazy good for nothing educators, you. Well, I actually think Mo Farah's kind of dubious face here really says it all. Um, but just to reiterate, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. You can't do that either, Dave. Any Daves in the audience? Sorry, it's totally not about you. I can't 
pass up a HAL 9000 joke. Um, and part of that gets back to this, right? In what universe does anybody, anybody at all, start from being a Microsoft Office and Facebook jockey, which is where most of my students start, and go on to learn all the junk I have up on this slide to purple squirrel levels in two or three years? What universe is that? I want to live there. So, you know, write all the competency lists you want. It doesn't matter. Students cannot master this list in two or three years. I mean, tell the truth. Could you? I couldn't. If you don't think you can do it, what makes you think my students can? Ah, but wait. Just a minute. It's not supposed to be hard to teach technology to law school and library school students, is it? Especially if they're fresh out of undergrad. Because people that age are all, say it with me here, digital natives. Isn't that how it goes? Well, digital natives is the second myth I'm talking about today. It's a myth. It's all a myth. The whole thing started from lousy question-begging analysis of scanty biased data from the richest county in the entire United States. It's been debunked all over the place. The truth is... Young people are not digital natives. They are not ready-made purple squirrels. And can we just talk about this phrase for a moment? I, I, I hate even saying it. I didn't even try to illustrate it, because what image could I possibly put up here that would not be a grossly objectionable stereotype or a cultural appropriation? The word native? in the mouth of a white European heritage person like me, centuries of horrific abuse, destruction, discrimination to answer for. So let me see if I get this, OK? We're going to refer to supposedly tech-savvy younger people with a term that has a long history of being used to dehumanize. And we're OK with this? I am not OK with this, and I apologize to everybody in this room and everybody who's listening remotely that I could not find a way to talk about this myth without using this horrible term. If you're as grossed out by this as I am, or even if you're not, really recommend this article on the subject. You can find it as a draft online on academia.edu. So what I'm going to try to do for the rest of this talk is use baby purple squirrels <laughs> instead. <laughs> if I slip, I apologize in advance. So can't we get over this baby purple squirrel myth already? Well, no. As often as, as it's been debunked, no, we can't get over it, because it figured so prominently still in talk about technology and about technology education. And why is that? Why won't this sketchy, false, dehumanizing myth just go away? Well, part of it is the usual dumb kids. I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. You know, that generational friction has been around since ancient times. And it's stupid, but I can't make it stop with one lousy keynote address, so whatever. And I actually think it's more than that. I really do. There's got to be something attractive, something that's useful to somebody. In this myth that young people are baby purple squirrels who know everything about technology and never have to be taught about it and don't need any actual time or opportunity to learn, what might that attractive thing be? Well, to get at that, I want to introduce the flip side of the baby purple squirrel myth, which is, of course, another myth. And it's another really nasty, repellent myth at that. It's the one funeral at a time myth, here illustrated as a pulp mystery novel by, the, again, the amazing Tommy Junk. According to this myth, people who are too old to be baby purple squirrels, and for the sake of argument, I'll say anyone over 30, because that's got cultural resonance for some of us, um, people who are older than that totally can't learn anything ever about technology. So all they ever do is get in the way. And the only way that's ever going to change is for those incompetent, incapable old people to retire or preferably die. 
one funeral at a time, how progress happens. Well, you know, the lie was given to this yesterday at the conference kickoff, right? Um, but in case you need more evidence, starting next Monday, it so happens, my age will be equal to Douglas Adams' answer to life, the universe, and everything. I am way too old to be a baby purple squirrel. This old lady, this old lady, in addition to rocking the purple, is rocking the technology and she is not at all retiring. One funeral at a time? You want my funeral? You're going to have to engineer it. <laughs> but again, I have to ask, what is attractive or useful in this pair of myths? Why don't more people push back on one funeral at a time? Nobody wants people rooting for them to die. Yikes. And to answer that, I keep coming back around to this knowledge-ignorance dichotomy. We oldsters, we're tech ignorant. Duh. Well, those youngsters, well, they just know everything. And here's the thing about that. Both these myths construct knowledge as innate. You either got it or you don't. You either have infinite technology knowledge, essentially, from birth, if you're a purple squirrel, or you don't know anything about technology, and you never will, if we're waiting for your funeral. Nothing to be done about it, either way. It's just the way we are, right? And that is what is attractive to a subset of established professionals in both our professions, because it lets them get away with what I call being ignorant like a fox. The kind of person who just loves purple squirrels so much, because technology is so hard. And they just don't understand it, and they never will, because it's so hard. But it's so great that there are these purple squirrels to do that scary, hard tech stuff for them, right? Or the person who blusters, well, I'm far too important to do that icky tech stuff. Go hire a purple squirrel to do that. Now, these people are not myths. I know some. <laughs> I'm betting that you do, too. And no, it's not everybody. But it's enough people to do real damage through ignorance, if nothing else. Put another way. Some established professionals cynically buy into one funeral at a time, grossly insulting and wrong though it is, because it's a get out of tech free card for them. Or if you want to think about this as educators, a get out of learning tech free card. Remember the skeevy gross echoes I was talking about? It's the ignorant like a fox folks who do 90% of the damage here. I really believe that. Because the ignorant like a fox folks will write job ads for purple squirrels. And they'll hire them because they need them. But these are the ones who have a way of not thinking about purple squirrels as fellow professionals, much less colleagues. And sure, they'll talk smack about purple squirrels behind their back because, hey, not real lawyers, not real librarians, right? And that's the gross, insidious thing about this, a thing that these foxes refuse to do, often because they can't. They also refuse to re respect or reward other people for doing. Take social media. A fox might dabble in social media and then write snide editorials about it. You've seen them, seen them right? You've read them. I have too. Someone the fox actually respects might be engaged with social media, and that's OK. Purple squirrels, what do people write about purple squirrels, especially baby purple squirrels and social media? What's the word they use? Oh, yes, obsessed. They're obsessed with social media. I dabble, you engage, they're obsessed. And that's how purple squirrels and tech-savvy people generally end up at workplace as workplace targets. This is not OK. It needs to stop. So granting that we've got a problem on our hands here, what do we do? How do 
do we shatter the myth of the purple squirrel, the myth of one funeral at a time, and replace these myths with healthier technology behaviors and attitudes? I actually think a couple of really simple ideas will do the job if, if we can push them as hard as everybody else is pushing purple squirrels and one funeral at a time, and if we're willing to live with the consequences of those ideas. Here's one. Knowledge of technology is not innate. It is learned. Whether it's learned through experience or instruction or both, technology knowledge is learned. Simple. Right? This is not a complicated idea. And it blows up the purple squirrel myth on the spot. Old people, young people, nobody is known, nobody's born knowing how to develop mobile apps. Nobody is born knowing how to troubleshoot Excel. We all learn how. Me by figuring it out as we go, probably not the only one. And here's another. You don't learn tech and then you're done. Any more than you learn law and then you're done, or you learn librarianship and then you're done. None of these is a fixed body of knowledge. They're all changing, they're all growing. So we've always got to be learning and relearning, all of us, and I'm preaching to the choir here, you're all here, right? You know this, I know it. So what we, all of us here have to do is spread the word. And that does mean that some of us who are looked up to where we are as purple squirrels have to kind of knock ourselves off our infallible purple squirrel pedestals. No, I wasn't born knowing this. I did actually have to learn it. But it's worth the price. I really do think it's worth the price. Because the emphasis on continuous learning is what gets the ignorant like a fox people in the gut. If everybody has to learn, then so do they. No more get out of technology free card. But you know, we're not gonna be able to turn our ignorant like a fox people into purple squirrels. This is not gonna happen. You know it, I know it, we all know it. Not gonna happen anyway, there are no purple squirrels. So we need another symbol for an acceptable professional level of technology knowledge. And the shark is really tempting. I gotta tell ya. Kinda wish I'd gone with a shark, but I didn't. How about a nice gray squirrel? <laughs> right, let's envision technology education for law and for librarianship as the cultivation of plain old, ordinary gray squirrels. Because actually gray squirrels are pretty amazing critters in their own right. First of all, they're real. <laughs> they actually do exist even here in Boston. Um, and aside from those of us with bird feeders, we have tolerably warm and fuzzy feelings toward <laughs> gray squirrels. This little guy here, he's pretty cute. Um, and they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They fit into a lot of different environments and they're absolute masters at adapting themselves to what they find, as anyone with a bird feeder will tell you. Um, <laughs> And ultimately, isn't that what we want from professionals in technology? We want them to adapt to whatever they find. We want them to fit in technologically wherever they happen to land. We want them to survive anything that the changeable technology world can throw at them. And we want everybody to feel some empathy, some respect toward gray squirrels doing the technology work, which is a lot easier. If everybody feels that we're all basically climbing the same tree when it comes to technology. So I want to close with some suggestions about how all of us, educators and working professionals, can make more gray squirrels. First thing is to commit Commit 100% to this goal. Every professional, a gray squirrel. Every lawyer, every librarian, and not after a billion funerals. Now, today, or at least as soon as we can make it happen. 
Ink's still wet on your diploma, you need to be a gray squirrel. Had your diploma hanging in your office so long that the dust on it is an inch thick, you too, you too need to be a gray squirrel. Now, it's easy for me to say. I just said it. It's much, much harder to do. But I do think that even if this too turns out to be mythical, keeping it as a mission statement is useful because it's going to kick us out of some bad habits of thought that led us to the myths that I've debunked today. An example of such a bad habit is the curricular rigor in the degree kick that a whole lot of people seem to be on. This idea that we'll graduate a whole lot more purple squirrels if we just make everything really, really hard. I need people to get off this at least around technology education. And if you think I'm saying this to make my life as a tech educator in a degree program easier, well, yeah. And then again, no. Yes first. Yes, it'll make my life easier because asking me for rigor in my technology teaching boils down to the same old, hey, where are those purple squirrels you promised me? Why aren't you graduating Mo Farah? And it totally ignores everybody who's done with their degree, which lets them play the ignorant like a fox game. And if that's not enough, there's one more very, very important reason that the rigor kick is not cool. We know the technology knowledge, just technology access, is conditioned by a system of social advantages and disadvantages that accrue to certain demographic groups. Digital divides, not a myth. The notion that tech is some kind of meritocracy that's open to everybody equally, that is the myth. So if what people mean by rigor, and it does seem to be, is weeding people out because they don't achieve Mo Farah levels of technology knowledge in two, three years, you are asking me to contribute to disadvantaging women people of color, the non-wealthy, first-generation students, rural residents who can't get broadband, others. You're telling me that these people cannot be part of our professions. And you're telling me that it's my job to make sure that they don't become part. And I refuse. I refuse to do that. It is wrong, and I refuse. Will I take on the job of making people who have been disadvantaged into gray squirrels rather than purple ones? Sure. I will do that. Because I think I can do it. I've had, I have some success stories. And I think it's what both they and our professions need a lot more than they need rigor, whatever that is when it's not being exclusionary. So yeah, gray squirrel approach to technology would absolutely make my life as an educator and degree program easier. And then again, no. Gray school approach does not make my life easier because it means that we educators will seriously have to step up our continuing education game. Both our professions need to get profoundly serious about true lifelong learning. In a way, I know they're not. And that scares me. That scares the daylights out of me. It's going to be so hard. It's hard to pay for. It's hard to deliver. It's hard to work out the right pedagogies for. It's hard to lead the horses to water and make them drink as long as I'm on the animal metaphor kick. It's just really, really hard. And I don't want to minimize those difficulties one bit. But I still believe with all my heart that the gray squirrel approach will get better results professions-wide than the blame the degree, blame the educators quagmire that we're stuck in right now. Whatever progress we can make, maybe we don't hit the goal, but whatever progress we can make will be worth it. Another thing we're going to have to do to make gray squirrels is calibrate our expectations properly. And for me, that means going from competency laundry list, which as I said, tend to be purple scroll fantasy lands, to competency roadmaps. 
roadmap like this here, because roadmaps acknowledge where people start as well as where we want them to end up. And roadmaps give them directions for how to get to where we want them to end up. And they even take into account how people are traveling. If you're driving, you get a different set of directions than if you're walking. Same way with learning. People start from different places. They have different needs. And a roadmap approach can account for that, where a competency list, just a list, really can't. There's a lot more embedded advice, a lot more usable wisdom in a map than in a list. And the number of people I've seen in library continuing education who really, really need some advising and some direction they don't really know where they're going or what they're doing. It's, I'm not going to tell stories on people that's super hurtful, but it's scary. So yeah, it's a lot easier to make that gigantic purple squirrel competency wish list, of course. But it's not nearly as useful. It's not really grounded in what I think of as professional reality. Third thing we got to do is bust one more myth. And it's a myth that I think is a real barrier for longtime professionals who, who are not where we wish they were around technology. This myth is a broken syllogism, thus Aristotle here, with his terrifyingly guilt-inducing empty eyes. And it goes like this. Smart people know technology. I'm a lawyer. I'm a librarian. So I'm a smart person, right? And that's where the syllogism breaks, because they don't actually know technology. And they feel shame about that. I've seen this hit my students really hard. They feel guilt. They feel the kind of, I'm just a fraud, inadequacy. The, you know, researchers call this imposter syndrome. I can only imagine it's worse for longtime professionals. The worst thing about it is that these feelings keep them from learning, even seeking learning. So if we're seriously going to deal with the low level of technology in our fields, we got to acknowledge and then deal with this broken syllogism in our degree education and in our continuing ed. That brings me back around to the couch to 5K idea. If you look at the very best how-tos for a couch to 5K, you'll notice that there's no blame and shame in them. There's no fat shaming. There's no fitness policing. There's none of that stuff. No assumptions about why you're doing it. You want to do a couch to 5K? Great. Here's the clearest, most specific instructions we can give you for how to do that from wherever you happen to be at right now. And go you. Go you for doing it. We need that. We need that in both our professions. I'm thinking it's probably going to take some strategic pushing, maybe even sometimes a little blame, to get the ignorant like a fox people past our broken syllogism to seek training. You know, never mind people who have been systematically disadvantaged or who are just afraid. But once they've taken that step, yes, I want to learn more. No blame ever, no shame ever, no judgment ever. We meet them wherever they're at and we help. That means a lot of us who pride ourselves on our purple squirrelishness, we need to check our dismissive attitudes at the classroom door, OK? They don't help. So this is the vision that I'd love to see some strategy work on right here at this conference. And please take it back home with you. Let's turn every single professional in both our professions into a capable, adaptable gray squirrel with a whole lot of gray squirrel buddies. Because let me just end with a shout out to Callie's own delightful Sarah Glassmeyer. I am so done with this creepy ass mofo here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks to John and Sarah for inviting me and Jason for handing me that great opener on a silver platter. Kelly on! We have a few minutes for questions if anybody wants to bring it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So we have the, what do you call them, oldie, old students? <laughs> oldie, yeah, Senex old man. I don't, not, don't know if you can see it, but. But those folks have been around for a while, have these probably larger salaries. We have newer folks that need a skill set. They can't pay them as much. 
but they desire all this work to get done. So we have these two kind of things, and, and as we know, libraries aren't exactly rolling in money. Yep. So they write these entry-level job descriptions that happen to the world. Mm -hmm. We attach as little of a salary as we can to mm -hmm. in order to hire. So I wonder if some, some of the myth is also backed by economics. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. How do you overcome that? Good question. Um, from the educator's side, what we do is make this as low cost, as cost recovery as we can possibly get away with. And that's not always easy either, but it's something that we at, at Madison have always held as a value in our continuing education. And for those of you who know me, you know that I'm not above a little blame and shame where it's warranted, and that's part of the reason that I'm calling out these job ads. The other thing I do, frankly, is warn my students. Here are some warning signs of a purple squirrel job ad. This is, an, this is a job you don't want to take. In hopes, and this happened to me in my first purple squirrel job, it happens, you know, those jobs become revolving doors. And hopefully, some, at some point, people wake up and say, we can't keep doing it this way. Um, we got to do something different. The other thing, and I'm working slowly on a book about this, there are a fair few librarians, and this may be true of lawyers as well, who really do. So in librarianship, we call this the union card theory of the MLS, right? The MLS is just a union card. You're not going to learn anything, right? But you have to do it in order to get the jobs. And this just feeds into an attitude of once you're done with the MLS, you're done learning. And that's something, is this true in law school as well sometimes? That's something that we educators and degree programs need to own and do something about because that is not OK. <laughs> we need to send people out not just knowing their need to, they need to continuously learn, but without the fear of it, uh, and with a toolkit for how to do it, which is the problem I keep running into as I do continuing ed, too many librarians who don't have that toolkit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of Sisyphus pushing the, as long as we're talking myths, the rock up the mountain, but there are things we can do to try to attack it. What you're saying about continuing education because I work in a, a business and um, I am the same age as that head of research where I work and I went to library school much later than she did. Mm -hmm. And so even though we're the same age, I have a lot of technical competencies that she doesn't have and she's too shy to right. go seek them. So we really, really, really do need to implement what you're saying. And that's hard because we don't have any continuing certification, any continuing credentials in a lot, not all of librarianship, but a lot of it. So there are some serious questions we need to be asking our professional organizations about why isn't this a thing? Why aren't we pushing it more? Conferences are not enough. Let's figure out what is. So thank you. I appreciate that. Anything else? If not, oh, sure, go ahead. Those of us who are training lawyers, um, particularly those of us who are training lawyers that have to go to solo or small firms, yeah. we're providing that very for reality out there that to practice in a way that we're not the, what was it, the, the soft underbelly <laughs> of the internet through which hackers just slash right through uh, various law firm technologies and steel trade secrets yep. so that people can practice in a way that's efficient and uses their time in the best way so that redaction errors aren't constantly made. There's an element of purple squirrel though that new lawyers almost have to have in yeah. order to be successful from the outset. It's an unreal expectation to try to set them up. The competency list we were talking about yesterday was just <coughs> what do you expect to know, not what we think we can actually graduate you with. Right. Um, how do we handle that? The reality says this is what you have to have. I mean, you don't have to know the database programming, or maybe you do. <laughs> well, that's, that's part of it, right? It's the, the sheer breadth of the things that might come in useful mean that curricular design is tearing your hair out time. 
Um, yeah, if I, had a, if I had a quick and simple answer to that, it would kind of make my career. I'd go on the, I'd go on the speaking circuit and be a millionaire. Um, I, I fight this every day. Uh, it, it's the hardest thing. There's so many things that people need to know, and we don't necessarily have time to teach them. The best answer I have, and it's an answer that I really try to work on incorporating hard into my teaching, is turn people loose on distinctly non-trivial projects. Just drop them into the deep end, and they're going to struggle for a while, but that's OK. 99 times out of 100, they get it, and then they know they can. That attitude of self-efficacy, and you know, librarianship, as you know, is female dominated, so I get a whole lot of students who come in without it. If they leave with it, no matter what else I actually taught them, I win, and they win. So getting rid of the false syllogism goes a fair distance. Um, you're only one person. I mean, do, yeah. you have do you have allies in this? Um, not as many as I'd like. <laughs> um, yeah, that's partly what this room is for. Yeah, spreading the good word, right? More than people want to give us credit for, I think. There are an awful lot of technology educators in degree programs, outside degree programs. There are a lot of working professionals really, really fighting to raise, to raise the bottom of technology knowledge in our professions. Um, in librarianship, for example, the wonderful Andromeda Yelton, uh, the amazing Bo Yun Kim, um, people like that. So they exist, and I guess my takeaway there is I would love both our professions to figure out how to support them more. How do we use them as, how, what force multipliers can we bring into effect to make sure that these people doing this work get the most support we can possibly give them to reach the widest audience? Don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I think it's the right question. Great. Great. Thank you. Have a break. You deserve it. Thank you, sir.